reading of the scripture that we're in, then please turn to Acts 9 and, uh, and the excellent leadership this morning uh, leading us into this. So let's, uh, let's go one more time to the Lord in prayer. Lord, be with us now as we think about the conversion of Saul who became the Apostle Paul. Help us to learn from, from this uh, from this event. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we look at what most people consider to be the most dramatic conversion to faith in Christ ever. Not just in the Bible, ever. His conversion is so dramatic that I am jealous. Have you ever been jealous of Saul's conversion? Assurance of salvation probably came easy for him, the way that the Lord brought him in. Some of us have to work on assurance a little more than others. Can you imagine going along about your business? And I'm not planning to read the passage again, but I want you there in Acts 9, kind of glad at times. But I knew that it was going to be read this morning. But you're, you're just going along about your business, you thinking you're right with God when you're not. And suddenly a great light shines around you, everyone with you. You hear a voice that the others can hear, but they can't quite specifically hear it. They can't specifically hear what's being said because it's directly to you. And it's Jesus explaining who he is and blinding you and sending you to another person to confirm it's Jesus and that Jesus is the Lord by miraculously giving you your sight back after he blinded you. I'm jealous. My conversion wasn't quite so dramatic. And yours wasn't either. Saul never doubted after that. However, we can look at what happened to Saul and how he was so miraculously brought to faith and how this murderer of Christians was completely accepted as an apostle by Peter and all the others and how his writings were pointed out by Peter as scripture, Peter says. Pay attention to what Paul is saying in scripture with authority, and we can gain even more assurance from some of his writings, among other things. Assurance is important to the strength of our faith. Friday night, with uh, proper social distancing and staying mostly in our screen porch, Barb and I got to hear Jesse's testimony and something of Jesse's road to Damascus experience that turned him in the direction of preparing for ministry. But I'm not going to say anything more about that. I'm not going to spoil it. You have to get that from Jesse. But it's just good to hear the experiences. Each of you, if you've come to know the Lord, has a road to Damascus experience to tell about, which is probably not quite as dramatic as Saul's. Saul says about this experience, he saw a great light. And we use the term road to Damascus for other things today. And we use the term, we use both of these terms, coming to the light for people to change their political views or their theological views or people who are discovering something for the first time. And so I want to think for a little bit about Saul's road to Damascus and his seeing the light. So there he is, he's traveling toward Damascus with a group of men, probably soldiers or guards, to help take prisoners. He sees the light literally on his literal road to Damascus. He's heading there to capture Christians and put them in prison on trial for their lives. And he oversees putting believers to death. We know this about Saul. His reason was that he believed that Christians were blaspheming God 
by equating Jesus with God and proclaiming Jesus had risen, this was a death sentence violation of the Jewish law. And Saul was zealous for God. But he didn't know God. Jesus got a hold of Saul when Saul thought he was already doing the Lord's work. But Saul was lost. And he did not know it. And there's evidence that Saul was convicted of sin as he breathed out murderous threats, but he would have not known why he was convicted of sin. He wouldn't have known why it was wrong because he thought he was following the law, and in fact he actually was. Saul was on top of the world in the prime of his young leadership of God's people, the Jewish people, the chosen of God. He was on top of the world. People are lost. We are lost like he was, even if we think we're not, until we're found. We're blind spiritually until we can see spiritually. So I want to back up in Jewish history to understand who this man Saul is and why he's so blind, even though he thinks fully that he's doing everything right in the sight of God. He's being zealous for God and a leader among the Jewish people, a leader among leaders. Pharisees were all leaders, and he was a Pharisee, trained by their top teacher, Gamaliel, who actually, if you look at what Gamaliel taught, was a pretty good teacher. And Gamaliel later defended and said, no, let's not, let's not be killing the Christians. And there's a tradition that Gamaliel came to Christ, like there's one about Nicodemus, two Pharisees. Paul said later of himself concerning the time right before the Damascus Road, he said, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. The Pharisees thought they were living and teaching the Jewish faith, but they were mistaken. The Pharisees, as a group of Jewish leaders, rose up at about the same time as synagogues, and in fact the synagogues seemed to have been their idea. Okay. All that began about 400 years before Christ, during the, right at the beginning of the silent years, after the last prophet in the Old Testament. And in those silent years, the synagogue movement and the Pharisees grew up sort of like a denomination in Judaism. And they ruled the synagogues where the Jewish people met and assembled to study and pray if they didn't meet in the temple. At that time, the second temple. The Pharisees unknowingly took the Jewish religion down with them. But God allowed all this, planning all along to use this as a contrast to Jesus and the church. That was all in God's plan, allowing all that. The Pharisees interpreted the law and added to it regulations to be sure a person was right with God. We know they were completely wrong. We can look back and see Something similar happened with the church around 300 years after Christ. Many of the leaders of what became the Roman church that spread across the world did the same thing as the Pharisees. They did exactly the same thing. They taught how to follow certain regulations and practices to be sure you were right with God. Even today, you can go on their website. And they'll tell you the three or four things you can do. They were and they are wrong, officially. These leaders insist on interpreting the Bible for the people, very much like the Pharisees had insisted. They were interpreting the Bible for everyone. There was a time when the church would put you to death for heresy, just like the Pharisees did. You see some of the comparisons? Many of the people who followed, and maybe some of the leaders in the Pharisaic movement, might have actually known the Lord, just like with the Roman church. Augustine, for example, 
And later, Martin Luther, who was in the Roman Church, and some others who saw through the legalism to the truth of the gospel. And both those men I just mentioned, Martin Luther and Augustine, they had their own Damascus Road experiences, which they write about. They saw the light, and they could have cried out, like the title to our message this morning, I can see, I can see. You might not know, you might, might know, you might not know that Martin Luther came to understand the gospel after he had his doctorate in theology and he was a professor in the Roman seminary and he met the Lord through the gospel. And he'd been teaching the Christian life. The gospel put everything in proper perspective for him. Uh, much of Christendom saw the light with him. And it brought them out of the dark ages. I'm just making this comparison between the Jewish faith and the church of about 300 years later because the leaders of both lost sight of the relationship with God. I'm making the comparison not, not just because it's true to history, but also the outward forms of Christianity are found today in all the denominations to differing degrees. And we need to be sure that we are not taken in by the ideas that are actually contrary to the gospel. Like the Pharisees were. Like Saul was. Without realizing it. We might have some who, like Saul, are lost. And like Saul, they don't realize it. I could have easily been such a person so I could identify with Saul. I was raised in the Evangelical United Brethren and Methodists. Boy, were we ever right. We were so right that those other groups that thought they were right, and we laughed at them. And then as it became the United Methodists when the two joined, and I was raised in church three times a week, fourth time when I got old enough for youth group till high school my, my dad was a pastor in those churches and then became a school teacher so nice of him while I was going through high school and my older brother and sister really nice for him to follow us into high school I was baptized at 11 had all the right answers in confirmation classes I would have told you I was a Christian I remember once in tech school in the Air Force tech school at breakfast, I was sitting by myself, and a, a fine other young airman came and sat beside me and started eating the breakfast, and he tried to witness to me. I said, oh, oh, I'm a Christian. My dad is a pastor. But I wasn't. But I actually I thought I was. I really thought I was telling the truth. So when I think of Saul, I think he must have felt the way I did. He's raised the same way, even more dedicated in the synagogue, at around 15, Saul was in what we would call today seminary. At 15. Learning from the top teacher of the day, Gamaliel. Kind of like someone learning from who's the man who now is called America's theologian, Wayne Grudem. Saul thought he was right with God in the Jewish faith, but he was not. In fact, he, like most of the Pharisees, had missed the point of the Jewish faith completely to worship God from a new heart. Not simply following the rules and in the same way, some today miss the point of the Christian faith. I was taught how to behave like a Christian. I thought I was one, but I was lost. In John 3, Jesus explains to Nicodemus, another Pharisee, and leader, about the new birth, and how no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus cannot see. He is spiritually blind. As a Pharisee on the ruling council, he believes the same way Saul believes. When Nicodemus asks there in John 3, 9, in that discussion with Jesus under cover of night about the new birth, 
Nicodemus says, how can this be? Jesus answers, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Jesus is saying to this Pharisee, he should have already known about the new birth or another way to put the new birth. It would be a conversion of the heart. You should have known about the conversion of the heart in such a way we become a new creation. You should have known. You're a teacher. Today the new birth comes along with the indwelling Holy Spirit and it was different in those times before the birth of the church but the new birth was a requirement all along. It's different today. The way it happens, we're blessed with the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling us but they still had the new birth. It's taught in scripture such that Jesus scolded Nicodemus for not understanding it as a teacher of the law. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, for example, Moses said, there in the very beginning of the Jewish religious system, which was being established by God using Moses, Moses said, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and your hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. In case you think that's an obscure passage, this teaching is easy to find in the Old Testament, but simply ignored by the Pharisees. It was never ignored by the prophets who called for repentance. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah. There's many of these, by the way. In Jeremiah 9, 25 through 26, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. They're just circumcised in the flesh. That was talking about the new creation. It was talking about the new birth. Circumcision of the heart. Until a person comes to personal faith and the miracle of the new creation happens, there's only the following of laws and regulations which will have some benefit in this life. But if following the laws and regulations could bring us into eternity with God, God would not have needed to send His Son to pay the penalty for believers of all times. Thank you very much, God. I don't need your help. I'll just follow your laws. I'll get myself into eternity. God would not have needed to promise that the Son was coming. Beginning in God's proclamation of this in the garden to the serpent, overheard by Adam and Eve and recorded by Moses later, the promise of the Son was always there. We would have not needed a Savior if we could save ourselves by following laws and regulations. Saul was the quintessential just wanted to use that word. He was the quintessential follower of the laws and regulations of the Pharisees, but without a circumcised heart. He was not born again. He had not become a new creation. Saul was about 29 years old, and he was a rising star among the leaders of the Jewish faith. Remember, he said later about himself, he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age. So now we know a little bit about this young man who was traveling to Damascus, a young man about 29 years old. Suddenly, through this experience, on his way to Damascus, which was followed by him going to see Ananias, we read all this this morning very well, who confirmed things, laid hands on Saul, for him to receive the Spirit, Saul could now see spiritually. God gave Saul and us through Saul a powerful object lesson. Saul was blinded, literally. And then the scales fell off his eyes, literally, and he could literally see. That's an object lesson for us. We have spiritual scales on our eyes until the gospel powerfully removes them. 
And we can see. Think about the time you went from darkness to the light of the gospel. When was it that you were able to cry out to God, I can see? Maybe you were a young child, and later you needed assurance. You still came to the point of saying in your heart, I can see. You were a young child, wasn't so dramatic. Trusted Christ, later you needed assurance. That's what happens. And now you know. Assurance of salvation, like salvation itself, is a wonderful experience. Not a word I use for a lot of things. It's a wonderful experience of confirming your gods through the miracle of the new creation brought by the gospel. You can see that God has given you the new birth and the new heart. You can see it spiritually. Saul was dramatically saved from being a religious leader who had missed the point to being a leader in the proclamation of the gospel and in making it clear that following the law never saved anyone, ever. Once his eyes were open, he could see, he was able to write what we find in Galatians 3.11. He wrote about half the New Testament. He said, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. And he's quoting Habakkuk in the Old Testament to prove the gospel and that no one is ever justified before God by the law or ever has been before the law, during the law, after the law. And today, Saul's eyes were fully opened. One more place where when Paul reacts to some who claimed to have converted from the Jewish faith to Christ, yet they tried to make it a thing of following the laws and regulations right there in the early church. In Philippians 3, 2 through 4, Paul said, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, not the ones of the flesh, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And then I could read on about all the things that Paul had on his resume that would have said he was a fine, zealous servant of God. But he put that all away for Christ. He didn't really like people who taught a false gospel of following laws and regulations. When I think of my own Damascus Road experience, there's a lot of moving parts that brought the gospel in its clarity to my attention at age 19. And I believed. I really didn't get any new information because I was raised in a church that taught about Christ. But I thought I was a Christian. I wanted to be a better one. But I didn't understand the gospel. And so I'm going to tell you what I thought. So here's what I thought. This is what I thought made me a Christian. I thought that Jesus made it possible for me to do a good enough job to get to heaven. And if I didn't follow well enough, I might not make it. But he would keep giving me chances, and so I should keep trying. That's what I thought. But that ended with desperation, because you can't try hard enough. You can't. You can't do it. If you really are realistic about yourself. No one can do it. I was sinking. So I, got, I got, actually got attracted to a Mormon girl that I met in basic training at the Airmen's Club that we could go to once a week at soft drinks and dancing and things like that. I thought Mormons were doing a better job 
and it would help me get there. Mormons have a lot of bizarre beliefs, but like every other false religion, you get to heaven by doing good enough and going through their steps of worthiness, and this is totally false. So to make a long story short, because there's a lot of moving parts, the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, God threw to me, and I could see. And it ended that relationship very quickly, and my attendance at the Mormon church trying to become a Mormon. We were on the phone, and she said, you're going against everything I've ever been taught. And I said, but I have met Jesus. And that was the first time those words came out of me. <coughs> And she said, don't you understand? The Mormon church is Jesus. And I said, no, it isn't. Clunk. I actually wrote letters trying to help her understand the gospel. The gospel brought me from darkness to light. And I can see. I'm still just a bit jealous of Saul. But when I remember my own road to Damascus and how Jesus made himself clear to me with the gospel, it helps. The road to, to Damascus is such a powerful point in history that it made it into the English language. You can look it up in the dictionary. The road to Damascus is any turning point now in your life. Maybe you decide to be an artist, you decide to be a doctor. You've done that because you had a road to Damascus. That's how powerful that is in the English world. Jesus made himself clear to me online with the gospel. So what about you? Are you able to say along with Saul who became Paul, I can see? Think about, think about that time. Have you had a Damascus Road time in your life spiritually with the gospel where you met Jesus? Do you know with assurance that if you die tonight, You'll breathe the air of God's presence. And you know, for a pastor, you think, oh, this congregation might not need this message. Maybe somebody you know needs it. But maybe, you know, it's good for us to have our confidence because we can think about all those things and see when God brought us to see that it will help us. Jim, who I mentioned earlier, who went to be with the Lord yesterday morning, expected, he was in hospice. Becky said that in the end, his face got happy and relaxed. She said he hadn't, she hadn't seen that for a while. Oh, that's my face. going into God's presence. So when you say, I once was blind, but now I can see, can you do it with full confidence? I like what Pastor Mike Sigmund says often. He says it in almost every message. He says, do you know that you know that you know you're saved, right? He says it in almost every message. Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the experiences of the early church in Acts. Thank you for the fact that you teach us so much through all of that. Help us to have the kind of assurance that's available uh, that we can see uh, the cause of you and the gospel and when we understood it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Amen.